Do you believe in fate? No. Why not? Because I don't like the idea that I'm not in control of my life. I know exactly what you mean. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain. But you feel it. You felt it your entire life. That there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there. Like a splinter in your mind. Driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? Matrix. Do you want to know what it is? The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage. Born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. Good evening, London. Allow me first to apologize for this emergency challenge. I do, like many of you, appreciate the comforts of the everyday routine, the security of the familiar, the tranquility. Enjoy them as much as any bloke. But in the spirit of commemoration, that, whereby those important events of the past, usually associated with someone's death or the end of some awful bloody struggle, are celebrated with a nice holiday, I thought we could mark this November the 5th, a day that is sadly no longer remembered, by taking some time out of our daily lives to sit down and have a little chat. There are, of course, those who do not want us to speak. We think, just let me I think. Expect even now, orders are being shouted into telephones, and men with guns will soon be on their way. It's chance of that. Damn it! Why? Because while the truncheon may be used in lieu of conversation, words will always retain their power. Words offer the means to meaning, and for those who will listen, the enunciation of truth. And the truth is, there is something terribly wrong with this country. You designed it, sir. You wanted it foolproof. You taught me every television in London. Cruelty and injustice, intolerance and oppression. And where once you had the freedom to object, to think and speak as you saw fit, you now have sensors and systems of surveillance coercing your conformity and cameras. your submission. We need cameras. How did this happen? Who's to blame? Well, certainly there are those who are more responsible than others, and they will be held accountable. But again, truth be told, if you're looking for the guilty, you need only look into a mirror. I know why you did it. I know you were afraid. Who wouldn't be? War, terror, disease. There were a myriad of problems which conspired to corrupt your reason and rob you of your common sense. Fear got the best of you. Confuse ourselves as living organisms with our idea of ourselves. That is to say, with a conception of myself which is called the personality or ego. We, that is what we have been told we are. And it's an extremely crude and limited conception of oneself. Making humans believe that they are just bodies and are expendable is the main agenda. 
That way they can elicit fear of death, sell them products to be more beautiful, perfect and better than others. They sell them medicine with side effects to fix their bodies and brains, but they produce the problem with GMO foods and meat from animals pumped with hormones or high fat, artificially flavored drinks and foods. They sell them cigarettes that they tax while humans die. They sell them perfect images on social media to kids and teens. They educate them in line with their expectations and nothing else. Without a comparison to what life could be, humans believe the lies they are taught from young, which are, life is not easy, just accept it. Life is hard work, not fun. Life is not an ideal scene and never will be. Don't live in a fairy tale. Utopia is unobtainable. However, life on earth does not need to be that way. Humans have simply failed to identify and isolate the ones causing the suppression on their planet. The key word in this scenario is help. Humans intrinsically like helping each other. They are a species that survives by creating for themselves and others. However, something has made them forget their creative abilities are paramount to all things and that help is the only way in which mankind prospers. That something is their economic system. Humans no longer know that life is a game with freedoms, barriers and purposes. Instead, they are completely reliant on their minimum wage jobs to feed themselves and their families while true creativity gets forgotten in the form of their dreams and passions. This is not their fault. The system is designed to enslave and trap. They no longer create with passion or help with love. The suppression this planet is under forces people to consider money above all else. It starts with their school system. From the age of 5 to 7, human children are legally obligated to attend school where they are taught to keep quiet, to sit still, to do their curriculums and to not misbehave for 6 to 8 hours a day. This of course helps human parents so they may still work while their children are being processed. The average young human will spend 10 to 15 years of his life in school. Creativity is suppressed and children are only to learn what they are taught. Original ideas have been frowned upon for centuries. Human children are further segregated by punishing the bad child and rewarding the good child without ever trying to understand why the bad child is failing. For those children who fail to listen to instructors, who step out of line, who show a lack of interest in their schoolwork, physically damaging drugs have been created to suppress children. A popular drug is Ritalin. Bad children are not born, they are created through suppressive environments. Politicians have traditionally hidden behind three things, the flag, the Bible, and children. No child left behind. No child left behind. Oh, really? Well, it wasn't long ago you were talking about giving kids a head start. Head start, left behind. Someone's losing fucking ground here. But there's a reason. There's a reason. There's a reason for this. There's a reason education sucks. And it's the same reason that it will never, ever, ever be fixed. It's never going to get any better. Don't look for it. Be happy with what you got. Because the owners of this country don't want that. I'm talking about the real owners now. The real owners, the big, wealthy business interests that control things and make all the important decisions. Forget the politicians. The politicians are put there to give you the idea that you have freedom of choice. You don't. You have no choice. You have owners. They own you. They own everything. They own all the important land. They own and control the corporations. They've long since bought and paid for the Senate, the Congress, the state houses, the city halls. They got the judges in their back pockets. And they own all the big media companies, so they control just about all of the news and information you get to hear. They got you by the balls. They, they spend billions of dollars every year lobbying, lobbying to get what they want. Well, we know what they want. They want more for themselves and less for everybody else. But I'll tell you what they don't want. They don't want a population of citizens capable of critical thinking. They don't want well-informed, well-educated people capable of critical thinking. They're not interested in that. That doesn't help them. That's against their interest. Learning is important. School is not. Education is vital. And ignorance is fatal. But, you see, simply going to school does not guarantee an education. I take that back. It guarantees an education, but not the kind that produces worthwhile thought. Instead, school as a system provides a thorough education in compliance. On social media, glam mags, in the music industry and movie industry, rappers are paid to talk about bitches and hoes and how drugs and money is what life is all about. 
female singers have to be beautiful and skinny and also talk about how money is important. Young humans are also exposed to competitions in the modeling industry and this has become trendy on social media. They love skinny girls in Japan. She has a fresh, young face. She looks young, almost like a pre prepubescent girl. Say hello, Nadia. Hello, Nadia. I'm Eden Magni was just 15 when she too was scouted. Tall and willowy, the size 8 Australian schoolgirl obviously had the perfect look but learned quickly, not quite the perfect body. Look, you look amazing, but like we just need that extra inch off or your legs need to be slimmer and are you running or because you just got a little bit too much muscle definition. And, and for a 15 year old as you were, what was that like to hear? <sighs> Destroying, like I'd walk out nearly every single time and just cry to my mum because I was like, I want this so bad, but I'm not good enough. It's just, it ruins your self-esteem. Were you just cutting down or were you starving yourself? Starving myself. I mean, I was hungry. So I, you know, would go to bed all the time hungry, but I was so scared of eating because I thought that that's what was making me not get that inch off my hips. It's not all about children and teens on earth. Adults are greatly suppressed as they have been taught to go with the system instead of against it. Use of the tobacco drug has been used as a suppression tool globally and it gets labelled as something unhealthy, a bad habit and a minor addiction. The truth is that tobacco products are extremely toxic, addictive and a profitable drug created to suppress humans. In the outskirts of this uh, East Javanese city called Malang and we've come Oh, to see a child. He's called Maulana Susanto. He likes playing football and smoking cigarettes. Indonesia is tobacco's wild east, where the Marlboro cowboy rides on. A glimpse of a country with few regulations. Cigarette advertising is everywhere. It's literally every direction you look. Down that way, trees lined with cigarette ads. Up there, a huge Dunhill ad. And over there, over my shoulder, there's an ad with what looks like a dad and his two teenage sons tucking into some rather delicious looking chocolate cakes. It says in Indonesian, manpatnya pas, it means the perfect taste. You know what? That ad is advertising cigarettes. Some porno. And right next to it, another ad. This time for Jarum, it's sponsoring a rock concert at the local Malang University. Chemicals in cigarettes as the most popular form of tobacco use has more than 7,000 toxic substances when lit. Many of these are used as pesticides. The thought of it is simply that if it comes in a fancy box and it is legal, it is not that bad. Cigarettes are highly addictive and poisonous to humans and the tobacco industry gains profit from 8 million human deaths per year. However, it is not simply a case of not doing anything about this problem. It is also a case of truth being suppressed by those profiting from the drug. started in approximately 1953 and went until late 1990s when these companies finally admitted publicly for the very first time nicotine was addictive and their cigarettes and products caused harm including lung cancer. 
In 1994, um, the so-called Waxman hearings, the seven CEOs of the seven major domestic cigarette companies came before Congress in a congressional hearing. And all of them sat together um, as they had been doing things together since the early 1950s um, and against the public and stood up, took an oath to tell the whole truth, swore to tell the truth, and they were quite simply asked whether each of them believed whether nicotine was addictive and whether it caused harm. And um, as people probably know now, they did not tell the truth. I'll begin my questioning on the matter of uh, whether or not nicotine is addictive. Let me ask you first, and I'd like to just go down the row, uh, whether each of you believes uh, that nicotine is not addictive. I heard virtually all of you touch on it, and just yes or no. Do you believe nicotine is not addictive? I believe nicotine is not addictive, yes. Mr. Johnston. Uh, Congressman, cigarettes and nicotine clearly do not meet the classic definitions of addiction. Okay. There is no right. intoxication. We'll, we'll take that as a no, and again, time is short. If you could just... I think each of you believe nicotine is not addictive. We just would like to have this for the record. I don't believe that nicotine or our products are addictive. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. And I too believe that nicotine is not addictive. Has now turned into two stories. How cigarettes can destroy people's lives and how one cigarette company is trying to destroy the reputation of a man who refused to keep quiet about what he says he learned when he worked for them. The company is Brown & Williamson, America's third largest tobacco company. The man they've set out to destroy is Dr. Jeffrey Wigand, their former $300,000 a year director of research. They employed prestigious law firms to sue him, a high-powered investigation firm to probe every nook and cranny of his life. And they hired a big-time public relations consultant to help them plant damaging stories about him in the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and others. While more than 8 million people die every year from the drug, it is still being sold, taxed by governments, and as governmental agreed method to be sold. Australia currently has amongst the most expensive cigarettes in the world. Most of this is due to tobacco taxes. These human illnesses prior to death are lucrative as well. Tobacco products worsen many illnesses and cause illnesses and big pharma, doctors and hospitals profit greatly from these illnesses. The posters are everywhere about the health risks of smoking. However, the addiction to tobacco products is stronger than these warnings and they know this. I want to give you some medicine about getting ready in the morning to learn your medicine. Then we end up. Then you're having me to find. And now you're ready for the day. And I too believe that nicotine is not good. One of the conditions that people still think about primarily though from smoking traditional cigarettes, we go back to cancer and probably lung cancer. But talk about again, lung cancer and the other cancers that people might not think about that are associated with smoking traditional cigarettes. Right, 85% um, of, of lung cancers are associated with smoking. We know that. Uh, but there's other cancers associated with, with tobacco smoke. Uh, you know, we could start on the way in with, with a head and neck cancer, uh, mouth cancer, esophageal cancer, um, uh, small bowel uh, cancer. So a significant amount of uh, malignancies are associated uh, with conventional t tobacco smoke. Uh, you know, other doctors will tell you everything from preventing heart disease or, or uh, other diseases. Mm -hmm. Smoking is just is bad. I mean, that, right. that's kind of the bottom line. Like you said, most of your patients are even aware of that if they're trying to quit. So It is not just bodies that take their toll, but human minds as well. Smokers think that cigarettes calm them and keep them happy. However, there are more people who smoke and have mental illness than those who don't. Of course, the psychiatric industry profits from these people as well. 
People who smoke tobacco have a much higher incidence of depression than people who are non-smokers. Scientists have suggested that smoking may be a factor for developing psychotic illnesses like schizophrenia. The analysis by researchers from King's College London, which was published in the Lancet Psychiatry Journal, found that people who suffer from psychosis are three times more likely to smoke than the rest. A new analysis of existing data published in the Lancet Psychiatry Journal found. While this association is nothing new, little research has been conducted into whether smoking could actually be a casual factor for psychosis. Analyzing data conducted around the world between 1980 and 2014, the team found that 57% of people first diagnosed with psychosis were smokers. The researchers also found that daily smokers developed psychotic illness around a year earlier than non-smokers. There are nearly 300 mental illnesses in the Diagnostics and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders 5, none of which have any cures. Can mental disorders be cured? That's what I'm talking about today. I'm Dr. Tracy Marks, a psychiatrist, and I make mental health education videos. I've been asked this question several times, and the answer is no. Patients, as they are called, are to take medication, of which all of them have short and long-term side effects. Humans take these medications because they have been led to believe that this method is the only way that they will find peace and happiness. Most of them come to realize eventually that while these medications may help short-term, they will need to keep taking them unless they decide not to. Most of these medications are addictive. Once they default off them, they suffer greatly, just as if they were quitting smoking and suffering from nicotine withdrawals. These medications also don't work on everyone, and the industry attempts to justify their lab rat system of trying every medicine until something works by saying that every person is different. The history of the psychiatric industry is not pleasant. Some countries still practice human shock treatments as a form of therapy. The reason this system is so widely accepted is because it provides order in societies. It is easier to numb individuals down with suppressive drugs than to address their problems directly and find the cause of their suffering. Society operates better in the eyes of those who need control by suppressing those who step out of line, even though they are the ones causing the problem. Once a human is diagnosed with mental illness, usually there are several others that follow after taking the medication. First he said that I had ADD. Then he said that I was depressed. Then he said I might be bipolar, but I don't have ADD anymore. Mental illness has been on the rise in recent years. However, is it really a wonder when these percentages of humans are in poverty, when suppressive environments are found around the world, where the air they breathe is being polluted with toxic chemicals, where drugs are easily found on street corners, where media stations keep enforcing that humans are all bad, control is taken away from the majority, making humans more reliant on the system, and where even the food they eat is being poisoned. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor to receive this award tonight, named for my dear friend and colleague, Thomas Sass. As Thomas Sass wrote years ago, the only true political virtue is obedience to authority, and the only true political sin is independence. Independence renders authority useless, and that is what infuriates it so. You've undoubtedly been told you're mentally ill for daring to say that the emperor called psychiatry has no clothes, not to mention stupid and unscientific. At least this is what some of my colleagues say about me at one university. So if this is something that has happened to you, I'm here to say that you are not alone the controversy regarding the myth of mental illness and psychiatry is not about science or medicine, it's about power. When psychiatrists start agreeing with you, well then perhaps you ought to reconsider your position. Something may be wrong. So I'd like to say a few disobedient things, which is especially true because I was trained as a psychologist and when a member of the profession criticizes its own, it's considered especially sacrilegious. What do we know that is true, that the cult of psychiatry keeps telling us is false? 
First, the idea that there is a known brain lesion causing mental illness. The truth is, we cannot tell who is mentally ill and who is not by looking at pictures of their brains or analyzing their blood. Psychiatrists had to invent their own book of diseases because pathologists would have nothing to do with them. It's called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, the DSM, a great work of fiction. What's the difference? What's the difference between the DSM and a scientific book of disease? Every disorder in the DSM is invented. Every disease listed in a pathology textbook is discovered. Real disease is found in a cadaver at autopsy. Mental illness is not. Mental illness refers to something that a person does. Real disease refers to something that a person has. Consider this yet another way. It takes one person to have a real disease. It takes two people to have a mental illness. <laughs> if you're alone on an island, you could develop a real disease like cancer or heart disease, but you cannot develop a mental illness such as hyperactivity or schizophrenia. This is because mental illness is always diagnosed on the basis of some sort of social conflict. When people do something that others find objectionable, they can be diagnosed as mentally ill. If the person doing the diagnosing is more powerful than the person diagnosed, then there was trouble. In this sense, the diagnosis of mental illness is always a weapon. Not so when it comes to diagnosing real disease. Think of how when people get angry with one another, they inevitably resort to some kind of diagnosis. They say, you're crazy. You're mentally ill. You're paranoid. Can you imagine somebody getting angry with someone and saying, you have diabetes. You have Parkinson's disease. Social conflict has nothing to do with developing a real disease. You don't develop diabetes because someone doesn't like the way you think, speak, or behave. You have to have someone else present to judge that your behavior is morally good or bad in order to have a mental illness. So diagnosis is a weapon, a tool people use against one another especially when there is some kind of power conflict present. And what of treatment? Treatment for mental illness is punishment. Look at our criminal justice system. When someone commits a crime and a psychiatrist is in the courtroom, a defendant may go to a mental institution instead of a prison. Can you imagine a judge saying, I sentence you to treatment for your cancer. I submit to you that psychiatric treatment is worse than prison. For in prison, they don't judge how long people should be deprived of liberty on the basis of what they think about themselves and the world. In a mental institution, of course, this is the case. If you don't think about yourself and the world correctly, you'll be punished longer. Psychiatrists love to say that mental illness is a real disease, just like cancer. The analogy between mental illness and real disease is not reciprocal. It doesn't hold both ways. Having cancer is not like being depressed. We don't shock people who have cancer to make them better, especially if they don't want to be shocked. Consider how melanoma, a deadly form of skin cancer, is a disease here as well as in northern India. If you have melanoma, does it cease to exist if you move to another country, another culture? Of course not. If you're wandering the foothills of the Himalayas and meditating for 15 hours a day, you may very well be called a holy man in India. 
Take that same person, have him walk across the grounds of the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C., and he's diagnosed a paranoid schizophrenic and committed to a mental hospital. What do you think psychiatrists would do if Jesus were alive today? Or Buddha? Or Mohammed? Bada bing! Right into a mental hospital injected with drugs to stop their crazy beliefs and speech. Psychiatrists today are the true grand inquisitors. They would crucify the holy men and women of yesterday in an instant. My father was sent from Nazi Germany to America in 1933 when he was about 15 years old. From the time he was sent out of Germany by his family because he was a Jew until his dying day, five years ago, he had nightmares that the Nazis were persecuting him. He fought against them his whole life, awake and asleep. I used to ask him, Dad, what were people thinking in Germany back then? What were they thinking when they saw the Nazis parading about? And he used to say, nobody took them seriously. Nobody believed they could ever have the power to do what they did. We laughed at them. Now, while I encourage you to laugh in the face of those psychiatrists who argue that two plus two doesn't equal four, know too that we must also take them seriously, especially when it comes to the harm they have done to people in the name of helping them. For if we do not, history will repeat itself. We are building a resistance to the psychiatric Gestapo. The Citizens Commission on Human Rights is an important partner in the fight for liberty and justice. That is why we are here tonight and that is why we will be together tomorrow. Thank you. On earth in grocery stores, unless a human decides to visit a health or organic store, most of the food aisles are filled with groceries that are toxic to humans. Most humans think that if they simply stay away from junk food that they will be healthy. However, the toxins are found in most of the food that they eat, including sauces, bread, fruits, vegetables and meat. Hydrogenated vegetable oils, genetically modified foods, foods containing MSG, other flavor enhancers, non-nutritive sweeteners, hormones in meat, pesticides on vegetables and fruit, and mass amounts of sugar, salt, and fat in many of the foods humans consume. What's more is that organic, free-range, hormone, and artificially flavored free foods are available, but only to those who can afford it. Remember the old days, the pies your mother used to make? You'd go into the kitchen, there's mom breaking eggs, beating them. There'd be rich country cream and sugar, and fresh fruit and real vanilla beans and butter. Remember all that? Well, you can forget it.
The industrial food system is not doing what a food system needs to do, which is not just pr produce lots of food, but to keep a population healthy. The industrial food system is making us very sick in many, many different ways. There is the obesity epidemic. There is diabetes. Four out of ten leading killers in this country are, 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 are food-related chronic diseases. We're talking about chemicals in our environment and our food, particularly a chemical called glyphosate. Well, I think this is a really important issue, just about the issue of real scientific scrutiny and what's fair research, because in most studies, you're supposed to financially disclose and you're supposed to publish the article and the data as it is. And we have seen in history, not just pertaining to this case, but other cases in which people have defrauded data and maybe perhaps did not report their financial disclosure. So I can absolutely understand that this is concerning. But Jeffrey, I had a question for you. Outside of the research that Monsanto has actually been allegedly involved in, what have you seen in terms of the other more recent studies? Well, I just published a peer-reviewed article where 3,256 people report improvements in 28 different conditions when they switch to non-GMO and organic diets. I speak at medical conferences regularly, and there's thousands of doctors prescribing non-GMO diets, and they're reporting the same improvements. Now, it's interesting that the areas that people report improvements from are also getting better in pets and livestock put on non-GMO feed. They're also the problems that afflict the, the animals in laboratories that are exposed to GMOs and Roundup. And they're the same diseases on the rise in the U.S. population, rising in parallel with the increased use of GMOs and the Roundup sprayed on them. 85% of the people who said they got better from something got better from digestive disorders. The next was fatigue, then obesity, then brain fog, then anxiety and depression. And if you look at the modes of action of Roundup and glyphosate, you would predict these type of changes. processed foods and cancer. According to a new study, eating 10% more of what's known as ultra processed foods is associated with a significant increase in overall cancer risk. And so Dr. Jen Ashton is here and nutritionist Maya Feller is here as well. Thank you both. Sometimes we don't even, we think we're doing the right thing and we don't realize that it's processed, ultra processed. Right, right. So one of the things I want to say to everyone is that you have to understand that ultra processed is processed food, right? Okay. We're talking about foods that have added sugars, salts, fats, preservatives, fillers, gums, you know, added colors and flavors. Things like, you know, these fruity yogurt drinks or sodas and, you know, energy drinks with lots of color. Some things that might be surprising, we're looking at, you know, packaged muffins and baked goods, deli meats. Deli meats? Yeah, deli meats, okay. refined breads. And obesity rates up in 28 states but also that more than a quarter of the population is obese in two-thirds of the states. But why, if we know this is going on, do we keep putting on weight? There is the single ingredient theory, that it's fructose. Fructose is the cause of the current epidemic. Robert Lustig at the University of California in San Francisco argues that the introduction in the 1970s of a low-cost sweetener called high-fructose corn syrup lowered the cost of fructose in general so that now it's showing up everywhere as he demonstrated for me, in quantities you don't really expect. Everyone seems to think yogurt is good for you, yeah. and you, yogurt is healthy. But this has 27 grams of sugar wow. for this yogurt. So wow. is it worth it? This has well, this 27 is, grams of sugar, too, yeah. per serving. It's everywhere. People have to know this information because it is alarming. Yeah. We're talking about in urban areas of the country, sometimes called food deserts, uh -huh. seven times the risk of stroke before age 45, putting young people in nursing homes for the rest of their lives. We're talking about comparing people who are obese and diabetic mm -hmm. in, with eating fast food with more than 10 times the risk of heart attack, and now scientists calculating the amount of years of life lost. The they have 45 years of life lost living in an urban food desert compared to people who have more access to healthier foods. Well, what is it in an urban desert? What do they eat that's so bad for them?
Well, you know, this is a, it's permeating all of America now. Mm -hmm. We have the majority of calories in America now is from fast foods and processed foods. But in certain urban areas, it's even worse because there's no supermarkets, no supermarket access and no produce. Our brain is very fragile. It needs a continual supply of antioxidants and phytochemicals from colorful vegetation. And without that, it deteriorates. It loses intelligence. And we have one in five Americans now have mental illness that is primarily traced back to not eating sufficient nutrients in the food we eat. The media and entertainment industry is used as a powerful tool to push the agenda that humans are just bodies and in need of their economic system so they may be healthy, beautiful, safe and important. Daily, news channels present 98% bad news and 2% good news. There are several apparent reasons for that. Divide and conquer by making humans hate other races and religions. To make humans think they are all bad. To create an emotional reaction by creating fear and further reliance on the system to distract humans from their real enemies. If the news was not suppressive, the agenda would be to bring positivity and stories such as these that are found globally. For my project, I am taking pictures of things that I find beautiful. Oh, oh, that's so nice. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> and you're beautiful. Oh, oh yes. Thank you. Sorry, not my fault. Oh my God, <laughs> that made my day. <laughs> very scary and anxiety-filled moment for a train passenger happened when he misstepped and got his leg stuck in the gap and in a very touching humanity moment everyone got out of the train to help him by pushing the train for him to be able to squeeze his leg out Humans are naturally social creatures. However, for a long time the agenda has been to divide and conquer. The agenda uses statuses and classes, races, religions and genders to highlight superiority and inferiority. They are brainwashed, manipulated and controlled into thinking that different types of humans are only as identifiable as what they own, what color their skin is, what god they believe in and what gender they are. They have made humans forget that they are all spiritual beings and not just bodies. They implant humans using fear with phrases such as white cops are killers, Arabs are terrorists, Hindus are evil because of their many gods, women can't do what men can, rich people are more hard working, and more. They will use whatever weakness they can that they cause to exploit the emotions of the masses. There are evil humans from every race, religion, gender and status. But most humans simply want to survive the suppression they and their loved ones are under. Okay. You got it? Pick it up with your big strong muscles and bring it over here to the shop. Boys can be loving. Fast, 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 fast. 
I need you to be brave, okay? Gotta go. Boys can be shy. Boys can be sad. Why are you crying? Boys don't cry, right, honey? Be a big boy, please. Boys can be self-conscious. Boys can be intelligent. I'd like to talk about some things that bring us together. Things that point out our similarities instead of our differences. Because that's all you ever hear about in this country is our differences. That's all the media and the politicians are ever talking about, the things that separate us, things that make us different from one another. That's the way the ruling class operates in any society. They try to divide the rest of the people. They keep the lower and the middle classes fighting with each other so that they, the rich, can run off with all the fucking money. Fairly simple thing happens to work. You know, anything different, that's what they're going to talk about. Race, religion, ethnic and national background, jobs, income, education, social status, sexuality, anything they can do, keep us fighting with each other so that they can keep going to the bank. I know, Joe. When uh, breaking in any new worker, and uh, of course, especially a woman, you've got to explain every angle of the process down to the last detail. And since most of them lack mechanical background, you, you've got to study every job and subdivide it into simple operating steps. Uh, women workers uh, don't mind routine, repetitive work, and they're particularly good on work that requires high finger dexterity or uh, an unusual sense of accuracy. I'm on my way to meet the wife of a man who Kula Mustafa Chowdhury helped prosecute and is now on death row. In 2013, a Christian rubbish collector called Sawan Masi was accused of blasphemy. An angry mob descended on his Christian neighborhood and torched the place. Dozens of homes were destroyed. Why is that doll pretty? Because she's white. Why is that doll ugly? He's black. And why is that the nice doll? He's white. And why does that look bad? Because he's black. And why do you think that's a nice doll? Because she's white. I just don't like the way brown looks because the way brown looks looks really nasty for some reason, but I don't know what reason. Mm, and that's all. I'm so ugly. <gasps> what? No, you made me cry. 
Black is beautiful, and if don't nobody ever tell you, I will tell you, you are gorgeous. If it weren't bad enough for humans that it is difficult to acquire a good paying job, to afford a home, a car, taxes, food, medical care, phone bills, school fees, and more, the economic system is designed to enslave and suppress by always being on the winning side. Where does the Fed get the money to be able to write this check? They get this money from nowhere. They literally just invent it. Here's a quote from the Boston Federal Reserve. Quote, When you or I write a check, there must be sufficient funds in our account to cover the check. But when the Federal Reserve writes a check, there is no bank deposit on which that check is drawn. When the Federal Reserve writes a check, it is creating money. End quote. So in essence, they're writing a check and creating money from an account that has no money in it. The money the Federal Reserve creates can be used as legal tender to buy things and eventually makes its way into the real economy. If you and I did that, we'd go to jail for fraud, but they can do it because they invented the system. This is the same system used throughout the world today. This is according to Oxfam, of the world's 85 richest people is equal to the three and a half billion poorest people. It's fantastic. And this is a great thing because it inspires everybody, gets the motivation to look up to the 1% and say, I want to become one of those people. I'm going to fight hard to get up to the top. This is fantastic news. And of course I applaud it. What can be wrong with this? Really? Yes, really. So somebody living on I celebrate a capitalism. dollar a day in Africa is, is getting up in the morning and saying, I'm going to be Bill Gates. That's the motivation the everybody needs. The only thing between needs. me and I'm that guy charity. is motivation. I just need to pull up my socks. I am oh, not wait, a, don't, I don't have socks. Look, don't tell me that you want to redistribute wealth again. That's never going to happen. All, okay? You know what? You take a simple stat like this, which is neither good nor bad. It's just a fact. It's a celebratory stat. I'm very excited about it. I'm wonderful to see it happen. I tell kids you know every day, if you... I'm just going to... What's wrong with this. up at a cocktail party. No, no, Amanda, one what's wrong with this one statement? One possible response If you to it, work hard, you might be stinking rich We're talking about people in extreme abject poverty. That's how you get three and a half no, billion No, we're not. You were just talking about really category. rich people. No. Okay. I'm going to tell you later. In the villages of Yemen, it's the children who suffer most. <laughs> Wherever you go, you can see the human cost of this war. 7-month-old Fatima is weak and severely malnourished. She's one of hundreds in this area alone. Her mother Sara tells me she won't stop crying. It breaks my heart, she says. The only thing Sara can offer her child is water. She is so malnourished herself that she's unable to breastfeed. This is fantastic news, and of course I applaud it. Things that make humans happy are being taken away, and those things that are available, humans have to pay for. Nature reserves, parks, zoos, all places of nature that humans need for mental health. Animals and nature have incredibly healing powers on the mind, and this too is being suppressed. Earth is experiencing massive suppression of their animals, nature and environment, or simply to support the economic systems.
It is apparent that there is two types of war on earth. There is war for religion, but more often there is war for economic advantages such as expanding influence and power and attaining resources. These wars are widely accepted and bringers of death are celebrated more than life as if these humans who kill other humans are heroes. This is what the media has led most humans to believe, that killing of civilian men, women and children is a noble sacrifice to save their country. طفل او ابن او اب او ابن ايش قد تنقهروا عليه؟ هلا نحن عم نروح لنا عائلات وعم نروح لنا طائفات بس انا انا الله نحن يا دول 
يا العرب يا عرب يا كل الدول نامي يا الخلايا